Good day. Welcome. Keith Valentine and myself, Nikki Stewart from Rock Jumper Birding Tours, welcomes you to our 52nd Dream Destination webinar with none other than our Mississippi Valley, Eastern Iowa, uh, Iowa USA based tour leader, Bobby Walt Wilcox. But I hear now, Bobby, that you're actually in coastal Ecuador. So a different location for today's webinar. Um, as I'm a different sort of island girl based on the other side of the world here in the Rock Jumper Birding Head Office in Mauritius, I'm thrilled that Bobby is lined up to entertain us with an in-depth virtual tour across two of the Caribbean's finest birding locations, the exotic islands of Puerto Rico and Jamaica. Surrounded by the turquoise Caribbean Sea, Puerto Rico is a rugged and mountainous island containing a wide variety of bird rich habitats. Today's webinar will take us into major habitats, offering us an excellent chance to see almost all the islands endemics. Added to that, we go to Jamaica to encounter all the islands endemic bird species. So that between these two locations, a staggering 46 endemic birds, including some very special hummingbirds, such as the Jamaican mango, the black billed and the red billed streamer tails and others, which are always a favorite among visiting birders. So you know the drill, Q&A is at the end of the webinar, so please send us your questions via the Q&A box that's on your screen, and we will endeavor to answer as many as we can. Bobby's desire to continue exploring the world in search of birds and other wildlife is limitless. And as such, he is the perfect speaker for today. Welcome, Bobby, over to you. All right, wow, thanks uh, for the lovely introduction, Nikki. Um, yeah, so um, glad to be back here on the, uh, the, the stage for, the, uh, for another Rock Jumper webinar and to talk about uh, a destination that I've recently become very familiar with, um, the Caribbean. So um, today we're gonna focus on Jamaica and Puerto Rico. Um, two of the undisputed gems of the Caribbean, and these are um, they're really these are really fun tours, and I can't recommend them more highly uh, as as rock jumper tours. They're 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 just really they're really nice, easy, uh, mellow tours. Um, something that especially if you're if you're based in the United States, you can you can just pop down. It's a short uh, week long tour, and they're really easy to you know tack on a couple days on either end if you want to just do some some beach vacation time, um, which these islands are great for. So um, it just makes for a really nice quick quick vacation. Like I said, super quick flight from especially from the U.S. But um, I understand from some of the British travelers that uh, I spoke to on my tour that especially Jamaica, since they have kind of a historical connection with. Um, with Great Britain that there's uh, pretty easy direct flights from there as well. So, um, and as you'll see in a moment here uh, with my map, um, there, this is kind of just really centrally located uh, in this part of the world and, and easy to get to, easy to travel around, easy to fly in between the islands. So just a, a really great destination all around. So let's move on here. Oops, click. So um, starting off, um, bird-wise, uh, one of the big reasons a lot of people are interested in, in the Caribbean is because um, sort of the, the very distinctive avifauna that exists there. Um, and <clears throat> as you can see here, there are seven distinct families that exist only in the Caribbean. So um, these days on rock jumper tours, and I suspect many tours, um, um, kind of the new trend, at least at least for me, it's not something I'm personally that into, but uh, a lot of folks are really into family listing. So, um, you know, the Caribbean is is a place you, you have to go because, you know, you got to you got to take off those families. So um, so in this uh, slide here, you can see that the top three are Dominican Republic only. So 
you don't have to worry about those for this particular webinar. You can go back and watch Clayton's webinar on uh, Cuba and the Dominican Republic. And he'll talk about these three and this one, which is restrict restricted to Cuba. However, these three are gonna be ones that we're gonna be seeing in our webinar today in Jamaica and Puerto Rico. Um, Puerto Rico and Tanager being a, a monotypic family and only, um, only existing in Puerto Rico. And then the Spindalises and Toadies, which are widespread throughout the larger islands in, in the, the greater Antilles and, and then in different forms can be seen on each island. So uh, just real quick, um, this, this is the, the field guide that I prefer using. I was gonna throw this in, the, in at the end, but I figured I'd do a real quick thing here. Um, this came out in 2019, Birds of the West Indies. It's a Bird Life International Lynx Editions publication. And this, this publishing company has been coming out with a lot of great field guides recently. Uh, they've got a great one with, uh, for Columbia. Um, our very own uh, Dushan came out with one recently for um, the Galapagos. So um, I highly recommend these guides. And as you can see, the plates are great. Um, it's a really good guide. It's a little bigger than the traditional uh, Princeton guide, which, which is good as well. I'm not as big a fan of the plates, but you know everybody has their own tastes. Um, so that guide is more of like a back of your pocket field guide, whereas this is, is more like carry it in your backpack and reference type of guide, but still relatively compact, good guide. Um, and if you want to go super old school um, and get some historical perspective, you could uh, <clears throat> check out Birds of the West Indies. The, this is the uh, original, the cover of the original 1936 edition. However, if you want to get this, you're going to have to drop a couple grand at auction for it. So you might have to wait on that uh, Swarovski purchase if you want the original James Bond. Um, which coincidentally, if anybody doesn't know the story, uh, James Bond, the ornithologist, is actually the, at least the namesake is what the, uh, the, the famous movie character is based off of. And apparently Ian Fleming, who, who wrote the books, uh, was just looking for the dullest name possible. And he was into ornithology and living on Jamaica at the time. And sure enough, uh, James Bond. So there you have it. Okay. So <clears throat> we're going to start off uh, talking about Jamaica, and this is just a just kind of a basic overview map of the island, showing the the blue or the I'm sorry the green uh, green markers are sites. So this is a really interesting tour because it's one of our few tours that's based out of one location uh, for the whole trip, which is really nice actually. It, it's it just makes the trip like very mellow. It, it's, it's, it's just a really relaxing trip. And uh, so basically, at least recently, I think we used to start in Kingston, but due to COVID things and various weird local restrictions, now we started in Montego Bay, and then you have to stay within this special tourist corridor and drive all the way along the coast. It's about three hours to the Greencastle Lodge, which is this dot right here. It's just a little bit off the coast. There's a little bay there. So that's where we start off our trip. And this is the view from Greencastle. Pretty spectacular, as you can see, with uh, the uh, <clears throat> John, I think these are the John Crow Mountains off in the distance here. The pool, which um, at least the guests on my tour uh, made use of liberally, uh, including myself. It's, it's, uh, it's quite refreshing uh, in the midday or in the afternoon when we get back from birding and, you know, the view is, is unbeatable. And, um, in a moment here, I'm going to show you some of the, the spectacular hummingbirds from Jamaica. But as you can see over here, this massive bush, this is probably about 15 feet tall. It's just filled with flowers and absolutely filled with hummingbirds. So um, there's really great uh, photographic opportunities just around the grounds at Greencastle. They've done a nice job of planting a lot of, of, um, of you know, native plants, bush, flowering bushes and stuff like that. So really great for bringing in hummingbirds, warblers, banana quits. Uh, so on and so forth. So there is that. So starting off with uh, with the heavy hitters, uh, the the uh, endemic hummingbirds of Jamaica. So this the red-billed streamer tail is the national bird of Jamaica, and probably um, one of the more common birds you're actually going to see, at least at Greencastle. I mean, I think in other places in the island, we didn't really 
venture out too far, but um, it's probably, it's pretty common all over the island, which is pretty awesome that this is one of the more common birds that you see on the island. Um, they are, it's just as spectacular as they look uh, in this photo. And they're, they're, they're pretty gregarious too, and relatively easy to see perched and, and hitting the flowers. So it's, they put on quite a show. Um, and just since they're so awesome, uh, <laughs> a couple other pictures, uh, you know, for you photographers out there to give you an idea of, of, of how, how good the photographic opportunities are, are there. And, you know, you don't need, you, you can take, there's a lot of great opportunities away from feeders where you can get natural backgrounds. You don't, the, the lighting is great. You don't need to have supplemental flashes or anything. So it's, it's really, really nice uh, hummingbird photography there. Jamaican mango, another uh, another really gorgeous endemic. This is one that's just sort of like this, um, has this sort of oil slick play of rainbow colors that, that hits you in a different way, depending on what, uh, what your lighting situation is. So like sometimes it can look just completely jet black and then it turns its head and it looks like this. Um, so again, you know, this is just walking down in the yard at lunchtime and, and snapping off a few photos um, just, Really, really nice to have such great um, hummingbird photo opportunities there. And I mean, yeah, you just get really great close up looks of them. They're coming right to the feeders when you're sitting in the pool. So it's pretty neat. Um, the other common hummingbird, and this is not endemic, um, it's also on the Dominican Republic, um, is the vervain hummingbird, which is the second, uh, supposedly the second smallest hummingbird in the world. I, I've I kind of feel like, you know, some of the wood stars uh, give it a run for its money, but, you know, that's that's what people say. So I guess I, I have to trust them, but it is indeed extremely tiny and um, they're um, sometimes more often heard than seen, although they're pretty common here at Greencastle flying around and chasing each other away from flowers, but they they tend to sing from high in the trees, um, but they can be really hard to find because they're so tiny. <clears throat> Um, moving on to some more uh, spectacular endemics. Um, I don't know about any of you people who might be dreaming about a trip to the Caribbean, but when I first got my first Caribbean uh, guidebook, the, the thing I zeroed in on was the toadies. Like the toadies were the coolest birds I could find in there. And that was the bird that I was most excited about seeing on my first trip. And, and they, they are indeed um, extremely adorable and, and they, they they live up to all the hype. They're they're just pretty cool birds, and they're they're tiny and, and active, and and they're they're pretty easy to see for the most part. Um, you can um, they're not easy to see when they're perched, obviously, um, green on green, but um, they're active enough that that you you typically tend to get many pretty good looks at these birds over the course of a trip. Jamaican Oriole, uh, another another spectacular specimen uh not technically an endemic they also occur on uh san san andres island which is uh kind of southwest of jamaica and uh, a colombian uh, territory i guess um but near endemic to to a very large extent um and as we'll we'll see uh over the course of this talk the the nice thing about the the caribbean in general is that there's there are very few species. I mean, it's 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 the blessing and a curse, I guess. But it's it's makes it easy to identify everything because every island has one oriole, one toady, one spindalis, two or three flycatchers, maybe. So you know, when you see something, you know what it is, and you don't have to think too hard about whether it's this oriole or that oriole. You know, it's the Jamaican one. Uh, okay. Uh, same thing with uh, Jamaican woodpecker. Um, kind of your typical, if you're from the US, you know, this might remind you of a uh, red-bellied woodpecker, Gila woodpecker, if you're from the Southwest, uh, fairly typical woodpecker from the Melanerpes genus, uh, makes similar sounds. And uh, this is, is pretty common and widespread in Jamaica. Jamaican euphonia. I should mention here that all the photos, except for the ones that say photo credit somebody else are, are photos that I took on this, these recent tours. Um, so this is the Jamaican euphonia. Thank you, Clayton. Um, kind of an interesting uh, bird from the from the euphonia genus. Um, actually, it's not the euphonia genus. I think it's a different one, but uh, that could be wrong. Sorry. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's it's a, interesting in the in the realm of euphonias. Let's say uh, because it's so dully colored. Typically, um, you know, euphonias are have a little bit more bright yellows and blues. And this one is, is a very subdued member of that group. 
also pretty common, commonly heard a little bit more difficult to give, get good photos of because they tend to stay high and, and, and um, you know, they're, they just are not always, so that's, this is a pretty impressive photo by Clayton, which is why I used it. Uh, orange quit is another uh, interesting endemic. Um, <clears throat> And I apologize for the, the lack of quality of this photo that I think the flowers kind of make up for it. This is an African tulip tree, which is kind of an in, in, introduced species in most of the Caribbean, but does actually seem to provide a lot of uh, food source for hummingbirds and some of these nectar feeding uh, tanagers like the orange quit, which is uh, endemic to, to Jamaica. And the reason I use this photo rather than a more spectacular one is because you really don't see these birds that well. It's it's very difficult to get good looks in, at them that aren't high up in the trees. And unfortunately in Jamaica, they don't really use uh, bananas or anything like that that they do in South America to attract um, tanagers and stuff. So it's it can be difficult to get good looks at these guys. So, um, you know, you, you take what you can get. Um, as far as uh, moving off track a little bit to a uh, Caribbean endemic, which is another another thing about the Caribbean, as I said before, um, a very sort of restricted, um, unique avifauna that there's not a whole lot of crossover between birds from North America, birds from South America, like quite a few uh, high percentage of the species that exist in the Caribbean are either endemic to the very specific island or endemic to the greater Caribbean as a whole and Greater Antillean Grackle uh, fills that, that void there. Um, so these guys are, yeah, in, on Jamaica at least pretty common, you know, typical Grackle fashion, hanging out in parking lots, big groups, um, making cool noises from palm trees. So you tend to see these guys pretty often. Jamaican crow, uh, another cool endemic. Um, this one's kind of an interesting story. Um, these guys, they can be really easy to see if you're lucky or they can be super hard. And we had um, a really tough time finding this bird on my tour. Uh, we spent seemingly the entire afternoon of, of our last day in the mountains where it's, it's just that it tends to be their stronghold is high up in one of our, one of the sort of mountain trips we take on this tour. And, and we searched and searched for this guy, did, did innumerable rounds of playback and finally heard one calling way off in the distance, ran uphill to find it, ended up finally getting, getting nice, uh, nice looks at it from a distance through a lot of foliage. But, you know, we were happy because we got to see it. And then sure enough, as we were driving out on the bus on our way to the airport, I glance out the window as we're about a mile from Greencastle and see this guy sitting right at the top of a tree, a hundred meters off the road. So... That's just the way it goes, but yeah, they are, it is possible to see them right there at Greencastle Lodge. And I think uh, Carlos Sanchez, who did a tour before mine, actually had them there the first morning. So that's what you hope for. And if you don't get them there, then you struggle to find them in the mountains. <clears throat> but they are a cool bird if you like corvids. Uh, Jamaican lizard cuckoo. Um, so this, again, <laughs> I have some goofy photos in here. This one is kind of, uh, funny because it doesn't actually show its tail, but all lizard cuckoo tails pretty much look the same. But uh, the the my my point here was to show you how uh, sort of uh, easy to see and gregarious these guys can be. And when you call them in, they come right in. And I couldn't even fit the whole bird in the frame; it was so close, sitting on a branch, uh, looking at this. So um, pretty cool. And these guys are pretty common and and relatively easy to get good looks at. Uh, moving on to some fly catchers. Um, like I said, every island has its kind of assortment of endemic and near endemic slash Caribbean endemic fly catchers. And um, Jamaica has actually has quite a few. Um, so first here is the Jamaican Alania, um, which is fairly distinctive uh, as far as Alanias go. I mean, if you've been to South America, you're probably familiar with Alanias and how frustrating they can be if they don't make noises. But uh, Jamaican Alania, um, aside from the fact that there's only one other Alania, is, is pretty distinctive in the fact that it doesn't have wing bars. It's got this nice eye stripe. Um, it's it's um, a little kind of browner rather than gray, so it's fairly easy to identify. Jamaican peewee, um, pretty common on Jamaica, pretty pretty easily seen in most places. Like typical peewees, you know, they tend to be flying around a lot, perching on the same branch. So 
easy to, to kind of uh, get nice looks at and just sort of your, your kind of your garden variety peewee. The, the, the uh, endemic peewees in the Caribbean are a little bit darker than, than like the, in the Eastern and Western wood peewees that US folks would be familiar with. So um, Jamaica actually has three different species of Myarchus flycatchers and two endemic species. Um, the larger and more spectacular uh, Myarchus is this one, the rufous tail flycatcher, which um, is, you know, again, uh, from a, coming from a genus that is, is frustratingly indistinctive uh, and, you know, if you only see the birds, very difficult to separate individuals, the rufous tailed is practically the toucan of, uh, of Myarchus flycatchers. So a uh, pretty cool bird and pretty easily seen around Greencastle um, and other spots. And the other one, um, <clears throat> as is clearly obvious from its uh, downturn, forlorn expression, this is the aptly named sad flycatcher. Uh, another uh, endemic Myarchus flycatcher in Jamaica and um, equally common and easily seen in many, many locations, uh, quite a bit smaller with, you know, obviously less, less rufous in the wings and tails, a, a duller kind of more typical Myarchus. And honestly, though, the sad flycatcher thing, I, nobody really has any idea why it's called that. It's, it's, um, yeah, who knows? Apparently it's most close, uh, it's, it's closest relative is the dusky cap flycatcher, which, if you're familiar with that bird, it, it does have kind of sad vocalization. So maybe the person who is uh, who um, described them just got them mixed up. Who knows? But sad flycatcher, they have it. Um, moving on to a few night birds. Um, so first one, northern potu. These guys are are. I mean, obviously potus are are awesome, and uh, they are pretty easily seen at uh, at Greencastle. This, this photo, the photo on the right here was taken just right at the lodge in the evening, just perched up on a snag. Um, and then the local guides usually know of a couple different day roosts for them walking around the trails of which there are, are, um, are many at the lodge. There's a, a very extensive trail system. So <clears throat> potus uh, are pretty, pretty easily seen there. And this one's kind of cool. I think this is the same bird. It was in two different locations, but you can see kind of similar molt going on in the wings. If, if anybody out there's a, a molt nerd and likes to like to inspect photos for these sort of things, I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> um, so then the even more spectacular night bird seen in the day at um, Greencastle is the uh, endemic Jamaican owl. Um, yeah, this guy is a, is a, is a real stunner and, and put on a pretty good show for us. Um, again, the, the local guide had a, had a nice, well, what he thought was a day roost for it. We went there and we couldn't find it and just did one quick playback about an hour before dusk. And all of a sudden, one of my guests like looks up and it's just right above us. Um, and he sat there for, I mean, we, we could have, we could have sat there all night and watched him cause he wasn't going anywhere. just watching us and, and calling. And so really, really, uh, and they, these guys are also, you know, fairly common around there and you hear them uh, at night. So definitely a bird that, that should be able to, to find and see there at the Greencastle Lodge. So back to the map here real quick, um, <clears throat> just to give you an idea. So here's the lodge again. And then the next, so the, basically the way the trip works is you spend one day at the lodge, you spend a couple days out at a couple different mountain locations here and are over here. And then you come back to the lodge for the last day just to kind of do cleanup. Basically just four, four solid full days of birding is, is all you need on the Jamaica trip to, to pick up all the endemics and, and everything else. And this, this dot just shows another little stop on, along the road en route for, um, for water birds and stuff. So from here, we're moving up into the mountains here, the high, higher elevation area. Um, it's called the Blue Mountains or hard, Hardware. It's, it's spelled hard war, but it's pronounced hardware in Jamaica, Hardware Gap. Um, it's kind of, a, kind of a look there, really nice habitat. I mean, still some deforestation and stuff up there. You have to get a little bit higher than this to get to real pristine forest, but um, just really nice habitat and, and lots of cool birds that are much more easily seen up here than down low. <clears throat> 
So first one uh, being the Jamaican blackbird, which is a really cool endemic. Uh, doesn't look like much, just kind of your standard all black blackbird, but it's got really cool behavior, as you can see here from these photos, a really unique um, behavior for blackbirds. It's, it's completely arboreal, almost never seen on the ground. And it tends to do this kind of thing, like pick at seed pods and forage in the, the crevices of, of bromeliads and, and cling to trees as well. I have a video of one clinging to a tree and, and acting very sort of woodpecker nuthatch, like kind of crawling around on the trunk and moving back and forth between bromeliads. So it's really interesting. And, uh, you know, I think they're, they are endangered, but uh, it's fairly, fairly uh, easy to get decent looks at these birds with enough time. So really cool bird to, to get nice looks at and watch its behavior. Uh, a couple different endemic thrushes on Jamaica. Um, the white-eyed thrush, which is a little bit more range restricted, tends to be up higher in, the, in, in these, these mountains and a little bit more difficult to see. So this is one of our big target birds up in the mountains. Um, as you can see, obviously white-eyed also has kind of a white collar, which is more difficult to see. And then the other endemic thrush is the white chin thrush, which <coughs> It tends to be a little bit more widespread. Uh, you do see these down at, at Greencastle as well, although they're they're not always easy to get close to and get good looks at. They're kind of a skulky thrush um, and very difficult usually to see the white. So I was lucky enough to be able to get a, a shot at a good angle from this guy to see the white chin, which is not always easy. One of the other uh, big target birds and exciting uh, endemics for Jamaica, the crested quail dove, um, and it pretty much speaks for itself. Uh, this is a really spectacular bird. And uh, another one that um, I think sometimes can be a little bit hard to find, but when you do, uh, they, they can be very uh, confiding like this one was. I mean, he sat there on this, he or she sat there on this rock for until we left, basically. It wasn't going anywhere. Um, so that was this always a very exciting sighting. And then we saw one later just sort of walking around and on the ground and, and you know, not, not very frightened of us. So very cool bird. <clears throat> uh, another endemic uh, pigeon dove guy, the uh, ring-tailed pigeon, not to be confused with the uh, um, band-tailed pigeon uh, common throughout the U.S. And, and large parts of South America. The ring-tailed pigeon is uh, endemic to Jamaica. So um, yeah, these guys maybe they're a little bit more arboreal, but but also you know, they tend to make a lot of noise and, and are, are fairly easily seen up in the mountains. Uh, arrowhead warbler, uh, is, if I'm remembering correctly, the only endemic warbler to uh, Jamaica and sort of vaguely similar to black and white uh, warbler, but um, definitely different kind of more fine streaking. Um, and you know, you can tell the difference. These guys can be a little bit harder to, to see. Um, obviously, they're, they're smaller, more flitty, but um, we managed to get some pretty good looks at them. So uh, I think that, that <coughs> this is one that, that uh, most groups shouldn't have too much trouble with. Jamaican Bacard. This is the only um, the only endemic Bacard to the the Caribbean. Uh, it's Jamaican Bacard. So, kind of kind of a cool little factoid there, and, and uh, another all black bird. Uh, clearly clearly different from from the blackbird with a much chunkier bill, and these guys are a little bit more a little bit more widespread and, and easy to see as well. <clears throat> Blue Mountain Vireo, one of the two uh, endemic vireos on Jamaica, uh, is also kind of a more uh, high elevation species and um, kind of unique uh, in the in the, the realm of vireos. Um, slightly slightly larger, kind of different morphology, different shape, and um, these guys tend to be a little bit more confiding than the other uh, vireo in Jamaica. The Jamaican vireo, <laughs> which are much more common but extremely difficult to get good looks at. Um, we, I, I don't have a picture of one because I couldn't get a picture of one. They were 
they are they're all over the place around Greencastle. You hear them calling nonstop, but man, are they they hard to get a good look at? And you you do you get you get fleeting looks, but 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 they're tough. <clears throat> Uh, Rufus throat solitaire. I should have put this back with the thrushes. Another uh, another member of the thrush family that is fairly common at higher elevations in Jamaica, um, as well as uh, Dominican Republic, maybe Cuba too. I can't remember exactly. Um, but these guys are really cool. Have a really cool eerie sort of drawn out whistle song that is is um, cool to hear when you're up in the mountains early in the morning. <clears throat> Um, so Blackbilled Parrot, uh, if you remember the map, there was a kind of a dot on the far uh, eastern edge of the island, and that's the uh, area called Eccles Down Road, which is kind of a famous birding area on the island, and that's where the two endemic uh, parrots are more easily seen. Um, uh, one of them being Blackbilled, the other being Yellowbilled, which uh, I do not have photos of, but the Blackbilled were... were um, a very cooperative came right into a tree uh, near us and, and you know gave us great looks and were really curious and kind of hung out there squawking for a while. Um, also see up in, up in that area see the other uh, parrots from the island, the green rumped parrotlet and the olive throated parakeet, which is a it's, it's a maybe a, maybe a possible future split. They also occur in the Yucatan Peninsula, but otherwise there's two separate subspecies in the Yucatan and in, in Jamaica. <coughs> So that one's a little bit more commonly seen. Uh, Jamaican Spindalis, getting back to our uh, Caribbean only families. Um, one of the, uh, another, another really gorgeous Jamaican endemic uh, up in the mountains. Yeah, these guys, if you find a good fruiting fig tree, um, it's just gonna be jam packed with Spindaluses. Um, so pretty common. And um, if, you, if, you, if you find the right tree, these guys, are, are really easy to, to see and, and obviously gorgeous and fun to watch. Chestnut-bellied cuckoo, man, this bird, <clears throat> this bird was was our nemesis on this tour, and and there was there was a moment there where I was pretty worried that we were going to have to uh, have to a bail on our last endemic, but. As you can see from this shot, we, we did finally end up getting some pretty awesome looks at the chestnut belly cuckoo, but we put in a lot of effort and, and a lot of playback time to try to find this bird and over two days and nothing was working. And finally, uh, the, the local guide and I, um, in, we, we put forth, uh, not to toot our, my own horn or our own horns, but a monumental effort of modern technology to download a different sound from Zeno Canto over data on our phones in the field. And I played it for him. He recorded it on his phone, then played it out of his play playback speaker. And sure enough, the two of them came in and started chasing each other around immediately. So, um, you know, it's just one of those moments that where you feel happy that uh, iPhones and such exist and you don't have to use some sort of reel to reel tape player out in the field anymore. <clears throat> But again, super cool bird, massive cuckoo, and who just they glide between the trees with these huge spread tails, and uh, really fun bird to, to watch. Wintering warblers. Um, this is another uh, kind of another one of the one of the exciting things about different parts of the Caribbean during this time of year is that, uh, especially for folks, well, especially for folks from not the U.S. who may have never seen these warblers, but for folks from the from the U.S. and Canada as well, who who you know maybe in the throes of a miserable winter by the time their January tour to Jamaica rolls around and they haven't even dreamed of a warbler in months, uh, getting to go to a place like Jamaica and seeing warblers just coming out of your ears uh, and getting great looks at them is is pretty fun and uh, and pretty cool. So we'll go through a couple pictures of those. Uh, American Red Start, this, these guys are, are, are common as dirt down there and it kind of becomes a running joke over the course of the tour. How, you know, 80% of the birds you see moving in a tree and put your bins on, it's gonna be an American Red Start and that more or less ends up being true. Um, second most common, probably the Northern Perula, um, but, you know, it's hard to get tired of seeing these guys. So pretty cool to just see them all over the place down there. <clears throat> Black and white warbler, also spectacular 
uh, gorgeous warbler seen pretty commonly uh, pretty much all over Jamaica. And as you can see, quite a bit different from the arrowhead warbler, so pretty easy to separate. Uh, prairie warbler, spectacular warbler that I personally don't get too many opportunities to see. These guys don't really breed in, in Iowa and I don't spend enough time on the East Coast at the right time of year. So I got the best looks in my life at prairie warblers in Jamaica. Um, as you can see here, that they're, the warblers tend to be pretty, uh, pretty gregarious and tame, much more so on their wintering grounds than they are on their breeding grounds, I guess for, for obvious reasons. But, but yeah, they tend to be pretty easy to see uh, as evidenced by this uh, black throat blue warbler, which was just hanging out on some guy's porch and picking up, who knows, uh, potato chip scraps, um, but um, posing for amazing photo ops. Um, well, this, this is, this was, uh, one of the birds of the trip for sure. Um, you, you know, you obviously go for the endemics, but, um, one of the Swainson's warbler is a really tough bird to see no matter where you are and has a pretty limited range in the U S so unless you live in the Southeast or are willing to travel there, you know, you, you may not have ever seen this bird. This was actually a lifer for me. And we put in a lot of effort to, to dig this bird up out of the forest and, Amazingly, they actually respond to their song, doing playback of their song, even, even during the winter. And, you know, after trying it in a whole bunch of spots, we finally got this guy to, to come right in and give us amazing looks flying around us. And he brought a warm eating warbler with him too, which was a nice uh, addition to the trip list. So really cool bird and fun, fun to get good looks at. <clears throat> uh, so that's it for Jamaica. Um, I'll end here with a couple of lizards. I'm, I'm not a, a, a huge herp guy. I'm trying, trying my best to, to keep learning. And, um, but Jamaica is pretty, pretty cool for herps. There's a lot of cool lizards and, and they're very easily seen. These two um, were fairly common ones around, around Greencastle Lodge where we spend the entire tour. So um, easy and fun to get nice looks at the lizards and, and get some cool photos. And I mean, you know, a lizard like this, grams and all like, you know, who cares what kind of lizard it is. If it looks like that, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. <clears throat> so real quick, I actually meant to put this slide at the beginning. I thought I'd put two of them there, but um, it doesn't matter. Uh, so we'll talk about now just to give you kind of a general overview as we shift from Jamaica to Puerto Rico. So as I was talking about before, here's just kind of the lay of the land as far as the, the Caribbean goes. You can have the greater Antilles in this area. You've got Florida up here. You've got Central America, Costa Rica, and then you've got the northern uh, tip of South America down here, lesser Antilles over here. So yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, very close to, to Miami, easy to fly to. It's like a two hour, less than two hour flight from Miami to Jamaica pretty similar to Puerto Rico. Unfortunately, from Jamaica to Puerto Rico, you have to fly back through Miami, which is kind of ridiculous, but it is what it is. Um, so just while, while I have you here on this map, one of the things I'm gonna talk about when we talk about Puerto Rico is the fact that being that it's, it's so far to the east, um, it kind of shares some uh, some avifauna with the lesser Antilles. So you get a little bit of spillover from some birds that are, that are, would typically be more or less endemic to lesser Antilles, but that pop into, into Puerto Rico and don't make it any further than that. So it's kind of interesting in that sense, you get to see some birds that you might have to go way down here to, to see otherwise. Um, and another thing that I'll mention is that Jamaica really awesome for warblers, Puerto Rico, not so much. There's, they've got some cool, uh, cool endemic one, uh, elf and woods warbler, but as far as migrant warblers, there's not a whole lot of migrant warbler action. And I'm not a hundred percent sure why that is. I suspect maybe it's just because it's so far East, like it's, it's just, just far enough out of their typical migratory path. Um, that not as many of them hit it and decide to, to hang out there for the winter. So don't see quite as many warblers, but, but uh, Puerto Rico makes up for it with other things. So <clears throat> just a real quick uh, overview of the, the map here and kind of the, the, the trip route. So starting off in San Juan, we sort of make our way over here to the coast, hitting some lowland sites, some coastal sites, pop up in the mountains for uh, 
to see some birds, then cruise back over to the coast down here, southwest corner, and then finish off over in this area and back to San Juan. So we do kind of like a counterclockwise circumnavigation of the island. Puerto Rico, it's, <clears throat> Puerto Rico was, was uh, uh, it was, I was very impressed with Puerto Rico. It's a really, really cool island, a really cool place. It's, it's gorgeous. Um, I didn't know what to expect because, uh, it, you know, the, the hurricane happened so recently and, um, you know, you hear the news from the U.S. about how long the recovery took and everything. I mean, I kind of expected there to be a lot of visible devastation still left, but I was blown away by how how well they had done at at least the stuff we were seeing. The tourist areas, I think, uh, um, you know, probably had a little bit more money to to rebuild, and I'm sure there were things that we weren't seeing on our route. But but as far as the the places we went, uh, it was it was miraculous how well the the infrastructure had been rebuilt, and the forest had had regenerated. I mean, a lot of the forest on the island was decimated by the hurricane. Just you know completely denuded. A lot of big trees had been felled, but um, it had really recovered well. <clears throat> so really spectacular, uh, amazing, gorgeous, clean beaches, um, which, you know, it's not necessarily a given to have beaches that are well taken care of and clean. And as you can see, the, the turquoise waters that uh, Nikki referenced in her intro are, are a real thing, um, and they are gorgeous. So and like I was saying, you know, it's a short trip. So if you want to tack on a few days at the beginning of the end to explore the beaches and the culture, I, I strongly recommend it. Um, speaking of culture, food in Puerto Rico was awesome, um, as well as uh, a, a surprising variety of local craft beers, um, which is very exciting if you're into that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and the food, this is uh, one of the, the more traditional dishes. It's called mofongo. Um, it's basically this crazy volcano tower here is, is like a sort of a mash of, of um, they, they take green plantains and they fry them like unripe plantains and then they mash them together with all kinds of like garlic and, um, and uh, pork rinds and stuff like that and make this sort of plantain sludge and then uh, make like a really flavorful broth with different kinds of meats. You know, this one is sausage. It could be shrimp or fish or beef, whatever. And it's, it's, it's really good. So lots of great food in, in Puerto Rico. <clears throat> okay, back to birding. Um, so here's our group. And um, you can see this is a pretty good exemplification of the, uh, the le high level of professionalism you expect from Rock Jumper. I appear to be playing on my phone here and local guide Julio looks like he's just sort of absentmindedly staring off into space. So who knows, um, we're doing our best. No, I think actually I was, I was feverishly entering birds into eBird as, as they were streaming by and, and Julio is, is trying to pick out some sort of specialty out of a tree. So we were really doing our job, I promise. <clears throat> um, starting off with some uh, endemics, Puerto Rican lizard cuckoo. All the islands have one. Every island's got their lizard cuckoo. Um, this one, I don't know if you remember from the Jamaican one, but that one had uh, kind of rufous wings. So they more or less all look pretty similar, but each one kind of has subtle differences. And not that it matters because they don't go to different islands, but it's kind of cool to when you see a new one to, to realize, oh, it is a little bit different actually. And these guys are pretty, pretty gregarious and, and fairly easy to see and, and common throughout the island. <clears throat> and oftentimes you see them like this up in a tree, just stunning themselves at the beginning of the day. Uh, mangrove cuckoo, another, uh, not an endemic, um, uh, but common throughout the Caribbean and kind of a weird one because its name is um, not really indicative of its behavior or lifestyle, at least in the Caribbean. I, we never saw one in a mangrove and I've heard that from other people, like they don't really occur in mangroves. Maybe they do in Florida where, they, uh, where their range extends also, but in the Caribbean, not so much, <laughs> but still a uh, cool bird. Um, Adelaide's warbler, that's right. Uh, Puerto Rico has two, two endemic warblers. I, I, forgot to mention that earlier. And one of them, and the more easy to see one is the Adelaide's warbler. Um, pretty common in lowland, like drier uh, scrub uh, habitats, but also in a little bit more developed forest. 
So these guys tend to be pretty common and are, are very vocal. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Grace's Warbler from the Southwest US, that's, that's kind of what they sound like, a very similar song and a very similar appearance as well. Um, <clears throat> Adelaide's Warbler. Puerto Rican Woodpecker, uh, one of the more common endemics uh, and pretty spectacular. I'd, I'd venture to say this might be my favorite Caribbean Woodpecker. Um, these guys are, I, yeah, I just love that, that bright red uh, and black, sort of blue-black combo. It's a, it's a really pretty bird. Uh, flycatchers, uh, Puerto Rican flycatcher, another member of the Mayarcus genus. And this one is definitely one of the less distinctive members. Um, luckily, it's the only, the only one on Puerto Rico, so it's pretty easy to separate from any other flycatchers. But um, yeah, like I was saying, most most of the bigger islands at least have their have their own uh, their own myarchus or or one that only exists on a few islands. <coughs> Caribbean Alania is one of those uh, sort of lesser Antilles spillover birds that makes it into Puerto Rico and kind of a more traditional Alania with wing bars, kind of brownish gray. You know, looks like an Alania. <laughs> Uh, gray kingbird. Uh, these guys are are pretty common and and fun to watch, chasing each other around and chasing hawks around and stuff. Um, pretty common and widespread in in both Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. However, they actually are they're um, year round in those places, but they do have kind of a short regional migration up into the more northerly westerly islands like Jamaica and Cuba. Where they're not seen in the winter so we did not have this bird on our jamaica tour but but they're everywhere every single ever checklist has a great kingbird or many of them on in puerto rico excuse me um puerto rican owl one of the two night birds that we seek out on the puerto rico tour um is uh recently been it used to be in the megascops um screech owl genus and was switched recently to its own uh, specific genus. <clears throat> but uh, it's, it's pretty similar to, to screech owls, it has a similar, similar song. And um, there's one little state forest nearby where we stay on the second night of the tour that's uh, it's pretty easy to get nice looks at these guys. And Forrest got a much better look at this one than, than we got at our bird because he got an awesome photo of it. My photo is blurry and terrible, but uh, thankfully this one exists. So. Okay, back to the map real quick. So the area of the bird, the, some of those birds we were, we were just talking about is kind of right in here. And next we'll, we'll cover some birds up in here. This is called the Rio Abajo uh, State Forest. And this is where the major um, sort of uh, captive breeding and reintroduction program is going for one of the more um, endangered parrots, certainly in Puerto Rico, but in, in the world uh, is going on. And that's the, the the Puerto Rican parrot. Um, and there he is, Puerto Rican Amazon, Puerto Rican parrot, same thing. Um, <clears throat> so these guys are, they're, they're doing pretty well compared to, to, to um, past years. And they have recovered really well since the hurricane. Um, they were, their population was completely eliminated from one of their sort of strongholds, but they've been reintroduced back into there and, and now have a significant number of breeding pairs. And they're fairly easily seen here at uh, Rio Abajo. As you can see, this bird has this sort of trailing antenna coming off of it, which is uh, some sort of radio uh, collar, radio band that is being used to track it. So I think I have to assume that means it's a it's a captive bred bird, but I'm not 100% sure. They may they may capture the 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 native ones and put uh, radio tracking devices on them as well. <clears throat> okay, uh, Antillean euphonia, um, and this is this is one that has a couple subspecies. It's kind of maybe a possible future split candidate. Um, uh, different ones occurring throughout the Lesser Antilles as well as Dominican Republic. Um, 
And actually, I think this one recently was switched to the chlorophonia genus, which is kind of apt. It's got the more sort of the blue and orange and different blues and more, slightly more colorful than, than other euphonias, more in the chlorophonia spectrum. Uh, Puerto Rican bullfinch uh, is a uh, really cool endemic. The bullfinches are, there's a handful of them over different, uh, different islands. Puerto Rico has their own version and um, they're uh, relatives of tanagers. And they, they can be fairly difficult to see. They're very easily heard, um, but sometimes they can be a little, a little retiring, but it's, you, you typically get pretty decent looks at them on a tour and they, they have a cool song too. <clears throat> Puerto Rican Oriole, um, you know, the, the Oriole on Puerto Rico. This one is, is a little bit uh, um, brighter uh, than, the, uh, than the sort of more dull Jamaican Oriole. Um, these guys also, they occur at different, different elevations, different parts of the island. So um, can, be a, can be a little bit tricky sometimes, but we managed to get decent looks at them in a number of places. Uh, a couple different pigeons and uh, doves to, uh, to have a look at. Scaly naped is a Caribbean endemic that is pretty common in Puerto Rico. Um, seen often flying over, but, but oftentimes you get nice, nice perched at, looks at them too. Uh, you know, really spectacular large pigeon with that cool eye and face pattern and the, the obvious uh, namesake, uh, Scaly nape. Key West quail dove is, is a, a, an amazing, gorgeous bird that uh, is, is possible on this trip and one that we put in some time for. Uh, full disclosure, this picture is actually from Dominican Republic because we didn't get to see this bird in Puerto Rico, but it is commonly seen in Puerto Rico. Um, we, due to uh, unfortunate scheduling of the day that we were supposed to see this bird, the, the place we were supposed to see it was a, a mountain bike trail and it was on the weekend. So by the time we got there, it was just packed with mountain bikers and, you know, you, you kind of sort of walk the trails, uh, hoping to, to find one of these guys walking the trails. And when you're, you're following mountain bikes, it's not so easy to do. So sadly, we didn't get to see this one, but it is a, a fairly common resident of Puerto Rico and, and should be gettable on most tours. <clears throat> it's a night of dove. Um, these guys are pretty common, but a cool uh, Caribbean uh, endemic, uh, occasionally making it as a vagrant to, to Florida, but strictly speaking, mostly um, Caribbean. Um, yeah, these guys are pretty similar to, uh, to morning doves, as you can see, pretty similar song with very subtle differences, but uh, this white patch in the wing, shorter, not as pointy tail, kind of uh, distinguishes them, less black spots from your more what, what people in the U.S. are used to seeing the morning dove. <clears throat> Uh, black whiskered vireo, another, this one is, is uh, um, not a Caribbean endemic, but uh, one of the vireos more commonly and more easily seen on some of the Caribbean islands, much more easily seen than, than the endemic vireos. And, and Puerto Rico does have its own endemic vireo, uh, which also is extremely difficult to photograph. So alas, you get only get black whiskered vireo. Um, yeah, just another map real quick, just to continue to show the route. We were here and now we're kind of going over into this area where we spent some time looking at doing a little bit more um, seabirding, waterbirding, stuff like that, which just this tour is really great for. There's a lot of nice uh, um, marsh habitats, um, oceanside habitats, which you don't get to explore quite as much in the Jamaica tour. There's a little bit of that, but not nearly as much as this tour, not as much of a focus. So um, one of those birds that we see here that uh, um, has a wide range throughout South America, but it's, it's, if you don't get to South America, it's nice to be able to see it in the Caribbean is a white-cheeked pintail, really gorgeous duck that's always fun to see. <coughs> uh, different terns, uh, the cabots and royal terns being the most common. Uh, roseate tern is also possible. We saw one distantly on, on our tour here, um, but uh, tour, Different turns are, uh, are pretty abundant along the coast and there's always a possibility of something uh, more interesting than the regulars showing up. <clears throat> uh, White-tailed tropic bird, always a spectacular bird to see. There's, a, there's one site where we kind of go up on these cliffs, um, probably 150 feet or so above the, the, the ocean level. 
and just watch the tropic birds fly around. And there's usually a handful of them. It's not the breeding season when apparently there's 200 pairs or something like that, but it's uh, a still pretty cool spectacle getting to see them out there flying around, chasing each other. <clears throat> Uh, clapper rail get some uh, get some nice looks at, at clapper rails at, at uh, one of our one of our little mangrove spots. This is a local subspecies. Soras as well are pretty pretty common down there in some of the marshy wetland habitats. Um, depends on the day whether you you and the timing you're there whether you get to see them out and about but you definitely hear lots of them and, and they're pretty pretty common and widespread in, in the wetlands down there. And we do do a bit, there's a big uh, National Wildlife Refuge, um, Laguna Cartagena. Um, and since Puerto Rico is a part of U.S. territory, everything is part of the, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service system. So it's, it's called, it's again, got the same imagery and everything like that. And it's a really nice spot. They've got a huge tower, uh, uh, really nice and, a, and a, uh, like a wood um, walkway out into the wetlands. So it's a really, um, really nice area. And, really really well done sort of uh birding uh birding assistance there <clears throat> sandpipers who do some cool salt flats uh stops on this tour down in that southwest corner of the island some kind of um uh tidal salt marshes type of places so a lot of different shorebirds stilt sandpiper is really common down there and the, the sandpipers tend to be fairly um, fairly easy to get close to, which is nice. Semi-palmated and sanderlings, both also common down there. Um, these two were not super happy with each other. Uh, well, actually the semi-palmate was not happy with the sanderling uh, encroaching on its, its feeding zone. So that's, that's what this picture portrays. Um, I'm not sure why I threw this in here. I think we've got our fill of the map at this point, but we're just kind of continuing on. We were down in here, continuing on over to this area next. Oh, I'm sorry, actually, I'm gonna go back. Oh, yeah, it's okay, it doesn't matter. It was, it was more a little bit staying in that Southwest corner and going up into the mountains to a different state forest, which is this one, Maricao State Forest. And we're kind of looking out into the ocean here at the Southwest corner of the island with the Laguna Cartagena here in the, in the, um, the background in the distance. Um, so you can see here that, you know, the forest um, has grown back really nicely, um, looks really nice and full. <clears throat> uh, up here, some of the, some of the good, more common birds um, are uh, Puerto Rican toady. Um, you know, always, always a big highlight seeing toadies. You never really get tired of seeing them and he, you know, you can always get a better photo. So it's, it's nice that they're common and, and easy to see. Uh, pearly eyed thrasher, a cool bird, um, not an endemic, but, um, but a local, uh, Caribbean endemic and local specialty and pretty easy to see in different parts of Puerto Rico. So a really cool bird if you like thrashers, which I do. Uh, here's one of, one of the big heavy hitters on the trip, the, uh, Puerto Rican tanager. And this is, this is what all of you family listers out there are, are, you know, getting, getting all excited about before you head to Puerto Rico is the Puerto Rican tanager, which was recently split into its own, uh, monotypic family. So it is no longer a tanager and is, is, is a Puerto Rican tanager. <laughs> it's got its own family and it's, um. It's, it, uh, yeah, it's only on Puerto Rico. So it's a cool bird. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty dull in plumage, but they have really interesting foraging behavior. They kind of, they're kind of weird and nut hatchy. They'll hang upside down from branches and pick into, into bark in and under bark and peck at the bark. And so kind of interesting, uh, unique behavior. And it's fun to watch them up here in the Maracau state forest where they're, they're pretty common. That's kind of one of their strongholds. Uh, Another <clears throat> really awesome endemic to Puerto Rico, um, the yellow-shouldered blackbird. Uh, there's a place along the coast near one of the places that we, uh, one of the hotels we stay for a couple nights that um, these guys are pretty common. There's a restaurant that actually feeds them rice, I think. And um, 
they can they can be really abundant there. Uh, we saw a flock of maybe 50 just hanging out in a tree right above us and, and just giving great looks, doing cool stuff like this, displaying and preening. And so it's it's really fun to watch and get great looks at this bird. Um, they are endangered, uh, unfortunately, um, mostly due to uh, breeding habitat loss. They breed in the mangroves and, you know, mangroves everywhere are, are struggling and um, Puerto Rico is losing theirs. I don't know if it's an alarming rate, but they're definitely, definitely losing theirs. Uh, so that and cowbird predation are, are issues. <clears throat> so um, hummingbirds, I'm going to try to move a little bit more quickly here. I told Keith and Nikki I'd go fast and I did not come through on my end of the bargain. So um, there are some, there are quite a few uh, hummingbirds on Puerto Rico, more than some of the other islands. Uh, green mango being one of the cool endemics, um, as well as Puerto Rican emerald, another endemic. The other ones are lesser Antillean species that sort of make their way up into Puerto Rico. The Antillean crested hummingbird is one that we get nice looks at down in the sort of dry lowlands. Uh, Antillean mango, which has a number of different subspecies, also in, in uh, Hispaniola. It's another possible future split candidate. The Puerto Rican one is, is somewhat distinctive plumage wise. So this is the Puerto Rican version of the Antillean mango. And then the green-throated carib, which is just an absolutely spectacular hummingbird. We were lucky enough to get um, a, a hot tip on the last day of the tour, and we're able to find these in a in just in a flowering tree in the middle of San Juan um, on our way to the airport. So got amazing looks at these birds, a, a half a dozen of them flying around this little tree. And real quick, uh, just uh, another interesting thing about the Caribbean is that there are kind of a lot of, because there's these, some of the birds that exist on different islands and maybe have started to diverge evolutionarily, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of future splits and armchair ticks that are possible. Um, loggerhead kingbird being one of them. Uh, this one here on the left is the Jamaican version. On the right, Puerto Rico, slightly different plumage, apparently different vocalizations. Um, this one's a little, little darker, um, no white tail tip. So, Kind of interesting and then banana quits which if anybody's travel around south america are extremely widespread and common all throughout central and south america the caribbean as well this is one of the more common birds we'll see but they also have a wide variety of difference in, in vocalizations as well as plumage as you can see with these two birds with jamaica and puerto rico this one being much darker above much whiter longer white stripe here in the wing as opposed to this one with a contrast here so yeah, something that's interesting to keep in mind as you as you see these birds and, and travel throughout the Caribbean. <clears throat> and last but not least, uh, another lizard from Puerto Rico. Um, unfortunately, these guys are invasive in Puerto Rico, but they are really cool and, and you see them everywhere. So, um, you know, you can't really resist taking photos of them when they're doing stuff like this up in a tree. <clears throat> and I think, oh, <laughs> one last slide. Um, you know, as I said, oh, sorry, <laughs> leisurely, fun tours, uh, Puerto Rico, you get a get in case uh, like me, when you're on a tour, you miss miss the opportunity to, to get your daily workout in. We find opportunities in Puerto Rico to make those gains. So there you have it. Thanks for watching. And uh, we hope to see you sometime soon in the Caribbean. Thank you, Bobby. Absolutely remarkable. Um, the beauty found in these two islands are, it's just staggering, it really is. Um, and if these islands weren't on your list uh, to travel, they certainly are now. Um, our next webinar is on Southern India with Stefan Lorenz, and it's going to be a big one. First time we're virtually traveling to India, and I don't want to give away any secrets about what you can expect. We hope to see you there. So keep your eyes peeled for the emails um, and uh, advertising that webinar link. Um, and before we delve into Q&A with Keith and Bobby, just to let you know, we greatly value our Rock Jumper tour leaders, um, but just as much we value uh, the support from our local guides. And, and as such, we've created a new division called Birding Direct where you now can benefit from local rates while supporting local businesses by booking your next adventure with Birding Direct. So to learn more about those tailorable tour, um, birding tour options, 
go to our website at www.birdingdirect.com. Thank you so much, Keith, it's all yours. Uh, excellent, thank you so much, Nikki. And yeah, Bobby, fantastic, wow. What, a, what, uh, what two islands those, those are, absolutely spectacular photos. And uh, yeah, just a, looks like a, a very, a very pretty part of the world. Um, just, just some questions coming in quickly just about the Southern India webinar. So before we dive into to Q and A, just to let you know that that uh, webinar is gonna be on the 23rd of March. Okay, so it's uh, in a month's time. But yeah, as Nikki said, look out for um, the, the save the date on, on those. We'll, we'll be sending those out as usual about a week before and then the reminders uh, the day before. But uh, that one's for the 23rd of March with Stefan. Um, all right, Bobby, let's, uh, let's get into it. Um, so William's asking, uh, are there preferred times of the year for Jamaica due to migration and, uh, and keeping in mind rainfall as well? Yeah, I mean, so most of our tours are scheduled in between November and February, which is, is the best time to, to, you know, sort of pad your trip list with, with migrants and get to see the highest number of birds, including the, the North American migrating songbirds. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we generally plan our tours in that, in that time frame um, to cover that. As far as weather is concerned, um, it's not, it's, I mean, it can kind of be rainy at any time. I think that generally, according to the guidebook, at least, they kind of say that that, that time of year, that November to February-ish or March period is, is sort of statistically a little bit less rainy, but it's, it's just, you know, it's the tropics. So, you know, you kind of take what you get and um, bring a raincoat and umbrella and, and hope for the best. But when we had great weather, like we didn't have any issues with rain on, on either of these tours. We drove through some rain in Jamaica, but but by the time we got up in the mountains, it was fine. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not like it's the rainy season or anything. <clears throat> excellent, excellent. And I mean, I guess most of the endemics are, are quite gettable year round. So if you technically yeah. couldn't get away during that sort of peak time frame, you could potentially look at traveling at a, at a different time of the year. And, and you, you might miss some migrants, but you would, um, but you still have a pretty good chance with endemics, I guess, hey, Bobby? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, and, I, and I would say, I mean, you you do you do see a lot of migrants, but if you know if you're from the eastern U.S. for 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 instance, um, you know you might not care that much about seeing a bunch of American red starts in northern Perulas. Like they're still cool, but like if you if your only time slot is in July, like you'll definitely still see the endemics. And um, yeah, so I, I think you could you could really probably go any time of the year. And and like I said, it's it's they're they're very short tours, and and you know similarly. If you like, if you couldn't take one of our tours and had to go on your own, like you could you could knock out the whole island in, in you know three or four days and see everything easily. So, and the local guides are great. Like if you want if you needed to do that and just hire hire one of our local guides to take you around. I mean, that, some people do that sometimes, and mm. so they're they're excellent on their own. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So I mean, an excellent um, excellent option for birding direct there as well. Um, with some of the with some of the local leaders, um, just uh, just one on the, on the trails usually pops up. Are there any difficult trails at all in Jamaica or uh, or in Puerto Rico? Um, Puerto Rico, no, definitely. I mean, Puerto Rico is one of the one of the easiest tours. I mean, it's all pretty much all road birding, um, and Jamaica mostly as well. Actually, is is primarily road birding with not a whole lot of elevation gain. I mean, you're driving between birding spots mostly. Like, you know, you're not walking more than a kilometer. There's one, the trip we to get to that crested quail dove. We had to walk up this. I mean, it was maybe 50 feet of just sort of a little a little dirt trail up to up a hill to some little Rasta man's little shanty hut kind of place and. Um, but everybody made it just fine. It was such a short trail that, you know, we managed, but that was all. Uh, so yeah, generally yeah. speaking, you'd be good to go. Anybody, any, pretty much anybody can, can, can manage, I think. Nice. So very, very accessible past the world for, for anyone really. Yes. That's, that's I should think so. Yeah. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, so not, not a birding related question, but, um, Sally just asking, uh, no, no, not Sally. Sorry, the question was there, but um, Jamaican currency, what, what currency they use in Jamaica? Uh, so they use, I think they're called Jamaican dollars. Um, and 
Yeah, you. I don't don't change them at the airport. Uh, don't go to the, the exchange because they'll definitely rip you off. Um, I experienced that firsthand, and so now I know better. But you know, I would just recommend taking taking it out of the ATM if you want to get money. Um, some they they credit cards are taken pretty widely in Jamaica. Um, in my experience, although you might, you, I mean, on tour, you don't need anything like you don't, you shouldn't really need any, any cash. Cause like I said, we're, um, the place we're at green castle lodge, they'll take either cash or credit card. So, um, you know, it's always probably a good idea to take out a little bit of local cash, but I, I wouldn't think you'd need more than bucks or something like that, mm. which is easily taken out, uh, with your ATM card, which is like I said, what I would recommend. <clears throat> Perfect. Um, and then quite a, quite a few people are asking around uh, tours itself. So just like combinations, do we do uh, Jamaica tours combined with Puerto Rico tours? Um, and then some folks also looking a little bit wider as well and, and asking, you know, do we sort of tie in um, the whole Caribbean in many ways or, or you know, the, the big sort of major parts of the Caribbean. So like Cuba and Dominican Republic. So if you wanted to get down there and do um, you know, two or three or four of these trips back to back, um, are there options to do that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, that, that's the tours that I just got back from was a, was a triple shot back to back Jamaica, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. And, um, sometimes Cuba is tacked onto that. It just depends on what, what fills up, but there's, there's also, a I think it's, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Keith, but I think a, a cruise that does the Lesser Antilles and focuses on the parrots and the other endemics down there, um, which is, I'm assuming that can be, that can be attached as, a, as an extension or something else can be attached as an extension to that. So yeah, most of them are structured such and, and, and scheduled such that they can easily be done back to back with another tour. So then, you know, if you don't want to, if you want to do something longer, and it's really easy to fly between the islands. The logistics are not that difficult. So, um, yeah, I mean, I had multiple guests from each tour transfer to the uh, to, to the su su ugh, successive tours. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely something that's commonly done and, and scheduled uh, such that it's easy to do that. So as far as Puerto Rico is concerned, you may not see, we're, we're sort of working through some, some scheduling modifications and working with the local guide to get some stuff set up. So we might not see that tour pop up on the schedule immediately, but we're hoping that, that pretty soon we're going we're gonna to nail down some, some dates on that and um, get some scheduled for later this year and then in the following year. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, Bobby. Um, I did put a, a message in the chat just briefly about that, but uh, a good point. Yeah. If you are keen on, on Puerto Rico and you do have a look at the website, you'll see it just says tailor-made tours there only. We are still working, as Bobby said, on the, on the 2023 dates. Uh, we should have those up fairly soon. And um, yeah, if you, are, if you are keen at this stage and you do want to just register your, your interest at this stage, just get hold of Crystal at uh, info at rockjumper.com and, and she'll make a note. Uh, George is asking, um, very interesting question. We, you mentioned the, the Puerto Rico parrots and um, you know how, yeah, how endangered they are. And uh, George is just asking, how many free flying Puerto Rico parrots did you see at uh, Rio Abajo State Forest? Uh, we saw two really well. We had to, so you kind of drive up to this little um, parking picnic area in the middle of the state forest, and then you hike. Yeah, it just depends until you find the birds, basically. We only had to go maybe 500 meters or so before we started hearing them call, and then they just came right in. And we saw that we had at least definitely one pair uh, calling and showing right above us, and then we had another slightly more distant pair vocalizing. So they were around and it was the kind of situation where we got great looks immediately. So we didn't really need to put a, a heck of a lot of effort into seeing them any better than we did, but uh, it's, it seemed like they were abundant and vocal enough that, that you had, even if you don't see them right away, you got a reasonably good shot at, at getting nice looks at them. So. Hmm. <clears throat> Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, cool. And what about raptors, Bobby? Um, any raptors around or they're quite, they're quite thin. Yeah. Um, so let me, they, they are pretty thin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
So Puerto Rico has a um, like a sedentary local breeding population of broadwing talk. And I didn't add the photo because I didn't get a very good photo, but um, you do see the up in the same place, the Rio Abajo, where you see the parrots, that's where the kind of stronghold for that broadwing hawk is. So that's kind of cool. I don't know if that's a, a split candidate or not, but it, it is a, a local breeding population there that does, is non-migratory. And then uh, there's some a similar uh, sharp shinned hawk population there that we did not see on the tour, but in some of those higher mountain sites um, that is possible and then red-tailed hawks are pretty common throughout in in puerto rico um, and jamaica and um, uh, what else ospreys are, are are fairly common uh, kestrels are everywhere um, you, you're probably fairly likely to see the odd merlin around and apparently in the past i would like uh, forest did a tour in puerto rico in 2020 and i guess they had a whole bunch of peregrines but we we had one peregrine flyover on in the van and that's it. So it might just be a, every a, each year is different with my you know they might get different numbers of migrating peregrines that hang out there. So so yeah, it's not terrible for raptors, but it's it's you know I wouldn't if if raptors are the main thing you're excited about, then you might want to look at a different tour. But <laughs> but you'll definitely see some raptors. So <clears throat> great, great. Yeah, thanks for clearing that one up. Um, but yeah, fair question. I mean, you know, they went. Went to any of those, like big raptor photos or you know, that no, type no. of thing. You know, the presentation was like Yeah. Good stuff. Um, so some some folks are pretty sharp and, and certainly know their birds around around uh, these islands. And um, Ron was just saying, no mention of black billed streamer tail in Jamaica and Elfin Woods warbler in Puerto Rico. Um, and I guess that's from that's from a photo point of view. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I yeah, I kind of forgot about that. I, I, I sort of briefly mentioned Elfin Woods warbler, and I apologize, yeah. I didn't come back to it. And and uh, but yeah, that's they're they're um, they're pretty localized, and, and they're endangered as well, I believe, and pretty localized up in those high mountain areas. Similar to you get them in the like the morning we go up to find the Puerto Rican tanager, they're just kind of you get out of the van and you just you just hit us. It was we were just swarmed with endemics and. So that, it's a tough bird. Even I asked, actually asked for photos from Julio, the local guide, who's an awesome photographer. Right? The Adelaide's warbler is his photo. And he doesn't even have a good for, photo of Elfin Woods warbler. So um, that may be for lack of trying. I don't know. He's, he probably could get one because he lives there. But but yeah, they're they're around and they're really cool. But they're it's tough to get a good photo of them for sure. And, um, yeah. What the other one? The... Uh, black billed streamer tail, which is tail. Yeah, again, um, the red build is so easy to get awesome photos of because they're just right there at Green Castle and the flowers and everything. Black build, you get pretty nice looks at them up in the mountains, but that that's um, they're a little bit more. There's unless you you kind of focus and find a flowering bush that they're hanging out at. We were kind of just because of the logistics and how we were we were really fixated on finding the crow and the and the cuckoo we sort of didn't spend a lot of time taking nice photos of black bills streamer tails um so you know if you get lucky and see those birds early then you might have a little bit more time to spend photoing black billed streamer tails but yeah they're out there you see them um it's it's not not an issue of missing them it's just i didn't get a good photo yeah. one <clears throat> all good all good um any mammals about um only invasive ones yeah mm. basically mongoose indian mongoose is the only thing you see on my dominican tour we saw a cool native um rodent it's kind of a, it's called a, a utia um but that's not part of this webinar but but so and i don't know if there's anything like that is i think any of the the uh native mammals from Puerto Rico have probably been been eradicated at this point. I don't think I know that there's a native there's a cool one called a Selenodon that's on Dominican uh, on Hispaniola and Cuba, which are really really hard to see. But but yeah, mostly just the mongoose, which you see pretty regularly. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I I put the slide in with the green iguana, and you know if you come from a lot of parts of the world, you're used to seeing a lot of mammals as roadkill. Um, but in, in Puerto Rico, it's all green iguanas because there are no mammals, really. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, no, not so much with the mammals. Yeah, different part of the world. Um, 
Then just just a quick one about um, the places. So so how many how many places do we stay in Puerto Rico, and and what's the style of those? Um, so let's see. So you start off in San Juan, and stay right on right on the beach in the in the sort of old town area of the city. So it's really nice nice modern hotel. Um, I think it's a I can't remember a Hilton or a Hyatt property or something like that. So it's it's a very nice hotel. And then pretty much everybody in Puerto Rico speaks both English and Spanish very well. So it's easy to, to communicate with people at the hotels and everything like that and restaurants and whatnot. Um, then we kind of head a little bit west from there, spend the night in a different Hyatt type hotel. Again, very nice, um, kind of a little bit out near one of the smaller towns sort of where Julio is from. And then we go and spend two nights down the southwest corner at a kind of a smaller, more rustic place. But but rustic only in comparison to the much nicer more modern hotels it's it's a it's still a very nice little hotel air conditioned rooms tvs warm shower or hot i think it had hot showers i don't pay as close attention to the shower temperature because it's always hot but <laughs> some people are very concerned with with whether there's hot showers or not but i'm pretty sure this place had hot showers too Although if one of my clients, Dennis Kirkwood, is listening, he might he might ha have an argument with that because he always seemed to get a cold shower no matter what hotel we were in. But uh, but I don't yeah, know. That's, but yeah, that sounds like me. That would yeah. be me as well. I always get a <laughs> cold shower. Were very nice. The, the infrastructure in Puerto Rico was 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 really surprisingly great. I mean, the roads are all great. The, the, so the driving is fast, um, and the hotels and restaurants were all awesome. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah can't speak more highly of it really <clears throat> yeah sounds like a sounds like a great spot just some awesome birds yeah great food uh great accommodations like just ticks a lot of boxes big, yeah. big high feel good factor very nice very nice a um, couple just last two last two uh questions here bobby your iowa city t-shirt what does it say <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> iowa city the greatest city in the world <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> probably a lot of people dispute that one. I don't know. This, I got this. I don't know. Pro, I went to school in Iowa City to college, so yeah. I probably have had this shirt for 20 years. And it was just, you know, I think there was this phase in, in fashion where people were sort of creating all of these things for these sort of locally oriented products. Like my place is the coolest and the best. And and some local screen printer was just making all kinds of like Iowa themed stuff. So I, I got this one. So it's just kind of a, a fun historical anecdote <clears throat> yeah yeah but i was, I was uh, to be fair I, I love iowa city you know if you're gonna live in iowa that's where you might as well live but nice nice i was expecting the chat there to almost light up for a second and just be like what really yeah. <laughs> 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 um and then just um sorry yeah another another question just popped in here as well so um al yunke park if i pronounced that correctly um has that recovered from the storms um i don't i haven't done a lot of research on that but my minimal research into the parrot indicates that that yes it has it seems it seems like that was one of the ones and one of the strongholds of the parrot that was just completely obliterated during the hurricane mm -hmm. but it sounds like it, it has recovered pretty well and that they've they've reintroduced from their their captive breeding program um, quite a few pairs of, of the parrots there and they're doing well. And I mean, one of the sources I read said that there's, there's more pairs, more breeding pairs now, at least as far as their census goes, roughly speaking, than there were before the hurricane. So it seems like they've had a pretty good recovery. <clears throat> yeah, it's fantastic. Apparently the, the whole population in El Yunque was, was gone after the hurricane. Like they, they were okay in other places, but that knocked out the entire, that entire part of the population. But seems like it's doing well now mm, mm, mm. sure okay um and then final question just a little bit uh a little bit something different to to finish off to some degree um william's just saying you know taking some fantastic photos bobby um Thanks. and he's looking at upgrading his camera and is just wondering if you have any suggestions um because a lot of your photos look really really good so uh, i guess he's wondering you know what you might be using and if you've got any any recommendations perhaps well, I, I anticipated this question, so I kept my camera close. Uh, so here it is. Um, so I use, um, this is all Olympus, and this is a mirrorless setup. So it's pretty lightweight. I think I'm working with like 
I don't know, roughly four pounds here, something like that. So I use the, the 300 millimeter um, Olympus uh, IS Pro lens. It's a uh, F4 and um, <clears throat> it's really nice. I also have a extender there, <laughs> the teleconverter. So it's another 1.4 times um, on the magnification. And I'm currently using the OMD EM1 Mark II body, um, which is pretty good. I think it's a, it's a nice like starter uh, body in the, the, at least in the Olympus mirrorless realm. And I'm, I'm thinking about upgrading, um, but um, I need a little bit more, a little bit more cash in the bank first, but, but, um, but yeah, this is a great setup. A lot of people, um, a lot of people use this, this body and lens setup, and it's worked really well for me. I used to use the um, Panasonic 100 to 400 um, uh, zoom lens, which is also really nice, but I, I notice a, a definite uh, improvement in, in, um, in photo quality with this lens. So it's, it's more expensive. Um, I won't get into prices here. You can look that up yourself, but I got this one used for probably, for uh, probably, I don't know, three, two thirds or three quarters of what you'd pay new. And um, yeah, I, I couldn't recommend it more highly. I'm, I'm, I mean, I could get better photos with, uh, you know, something that costs twice as much and weighed twice as much, but I just, I just can't, personally, I can't be bothered to be carrying around like 10, 15 pounds worth of camera in the field. So I really like mirrorless. It's, it's what I've been working with for a while. And, and, um, you know, I think it's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And Olympus. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> nice, Bobby. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it looks very nice with the, uh, with the images you've taken as well. It's, uh, yeah, thanks. Seriously stunning photos. Yeah. A lot of folks have, have taken note of that and thanks everyone for, for joining us uh, this evening and for sharing the love for, for Bobby's presentation on this part of the Caribbean. Um, it's been wonderful. Um, well, we say seeing you, but we, we see all the numbers. We don't get to see your faces, but it's, uh, it's always wonderful connecting with you all and uh, for joining us. And um, yeah, until next time, as I say, we're not doing these nearly as often uh, these days because the, the guys are out in the field and, and everyone's out guiding again and, and trips are picking up and the world's opening up. So it's, it's wonderful to see, but it's always great to, to connect with you all. And um, yeah, until next time, keep well. Bye from all of us. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate Perfect. it. Take care. Bye.